present, I'll call the Public Health and Safety Committee meeting for Monday, February 18th, 2019 to order. Um, the um, first order of business on our agenda tonight is the minutes of our previous meetings, 12-17 of 18 and 1-31 of 19. Um, any revisions necessary for the minutes? They were included in the packets. If not, a motion to approve is appropriate. Motion by Peckham. Is there a second by McElhaney? Uh, members in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. The minutes are approved. Um, item number two is to consider approval or denial of various license applications. Um, there are no denials recommended for this month. So um, you have uh, on the list um, the license applicants and the events that have applied for this month. Um, with that, if there's no specific questions on any of the applications, a motion to accept or deny licenses as recommended by staff would be appropriate. Motion by Peckham. Is there a second? Second by Herbst. You have a comment, Pat? I just had a, a question on the event application for the honor flight, the time of the thing. It said 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Mary? Yeah, that's what they applied for, so. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, well, may, maybe the run itself is only an hour. I know they usually congregate over at Bull Falls afterwards. Um, okay. But that's what they put on their app. We could certainly look into it further, Pat, and let you know. It's an annual event, though, right? Normally right. it goes all afternoon, but they're usually done by 4 or 5. I would think that if some of those, I don't know if it's a 5K or whatever, but if some of the people are going to be walking, it's going to take them a while. So. Okay. I don't know. Well, we won't let them walk. <laughs> Tell them they got to run. All right. With a motion and a second on the floor um, to accept or deny licenses as recommended by staff. Members in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. Those licenses then are approved. Um, item number three is to consider a good cause extension to be open for business from the Whitewater Music Hall. Um, you know that the Whitewater Music Hall is um, currently under renovation. Um, those um, renovations are ongoing. We have the principals from Whitewater um, with us this evening if you have questions for them. Um, what they're seeking, though, is a good cause extension um, for their license. Uh, theirs is a reserve, correct? Theirs is a reserve. Is a reserve. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not one of those licenses that we would have to um, uh, offer up for all takers. It's, it's a reserve that they've purchased. Um, does anyone have questions for the applicants at all? If not, is there a motion to um, approve the extension? And uh, I believe the extension request was, was it 90 days? This I would be the extension for 90 yes. days, correct? Do we have a motion to extend Whitewater for 90 days? Motion by Herbst. Is there a second? Second by Kelbach. Welcome back. Um, members in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed. Um, that extension then is granted. Uh, let's see. We have uh, consider Central Business District obstruction permit. Um, petitioner for that is, is uh, Wasser River District. Um, let me switch back to the packet here. I think that one is for a sign, isn't it? I gotta go back. I gotta find their request. Here, we got it here. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, sandwich boards, flags, um, two painted pianos, um, all of these things that normally are, are um, throughout the River District downtown all summer. Um, every year they have to get an obstruction permit for those to sit outside. Um, does anybody have questions on those items? I think they've all been out before. Do we have a motion to approve the obstruction permit for those items? Motion by McElhaney, is there a second? Second by Herbst. Further discussion or questions? Hearing and seeing none, members in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None are opposed, that motion carries. And I'm going to just move our agenda around just a tiny bit because we have a couple of real quick items I want to get through, and then we're going to get to the um, animal item. Um, item number six is the <laughs> operations report from the fire department for December of 2018 and January 2019. Um, the reports are in your packets. Anything on the reports that you wish to ask the chief about or want more information on? Anything on the reports that you want to talk about, chief? I have nothing in addition. Okay. If not, we'll place their reports on file. Um, item number seven is tavern activities, compliance checks, and law enforcement activities. Um, same effort there. Um, anything within the report that's in your packets that you want additional information 
on um, from the police department. If not, anything on the report that you wanted to talk about in detail, Todd? No, I would say just um, for New Year's Eve, I don't know that I would describe it as sedate, but it seemed a, 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 a little, little more, more chill than normal. Correct. Okay, good, good. It's a good thing. All right, so with that, we place their report on file as well. You don't have to act on either of those. Um, and so those are the only action items on our agenda tonight, with the exception of item number five, which is discussion and possible action on amending section 8.08.001 .001 definitions and section 8.08.010 .010 certain creatures forbidden. And a couple months ago, we started this discussion um, as a result um, of an incident we had where um, a resident was harboring a, um, well, a wild animal, essentially a fox as a pet, as a domestic pet. Um, that animal escaped containment and then um, ended up biting a community resource officer um, in trying to um, lure it back to its home. And so obviously those animals are not vaccinated for rabies and the only way to discern whether or not the officer had been exposed to rabies was to euthanize the animal and test it post-mortem. So that was done. And arising out of that um, effort um, came a request um, from the police department that we take a look at um, what we allow um, for domestic animals in homes and what we allow people to harbor in homes as far as animals that are normally found in the wild. As part of that effort, um, we undertook uh, a little research to find out how other municipalities in the state handle these, these animals and others. And so with that, we had obtained some drafts of some ordinances that are in play in some other Wisconsin cities. That said, we seldom, if ever, um, adopt the first draft of an ordinance like this. Um, the committee talks about it. We um, take the best parts of some of those ordinances and then we also make some adjustments to find something that works for Wausau. And so part of that is public engagement. And so at our last meeting when we talked about it in December, we had no one, in the, no one from the public in attendance to offer any insight or feedback. And so we decided not to act on it. And what we really wanted to do then was engage the public and find out um, how our residents feel about um, some of the things that are on this list. And obviously the list is exhaustive and some of the items, you know, we would think at first blush the list is somewhat impractical. I don't know that I've heard of anyone harboring rhinoceroses and things in their homes, but the list is pretty long. One of the things that has happened between December and now is the committee has received a volume of feedback from the public through calls and email. We're also going to accept your public feedback tonight and record it. Um, is that a number of people uh, are very um, passionate about reptiles and we all I think have agreed through our review of the draft that perhaps the extensiveness of the reptile section of this band really goes a bit too far and I think that um, a lot of these animals already exist in homes in the community and that it's possible that at least on the reptile end um, part of that may have to be rewritten or walked back and I think as a committee we'll decide what we need to tweak after we get that public feedback. But we won't make any final decision on it tonight. What we'll do is accept public feedback, um, go over what we have as a draft, see what direction we want to go, and then with that, our legal team then will make some adjustments, and then we will re-review the draft uh, in a subsequent meeting. So um, no final action tonight, and no action will come from this meeting tonight that will end up with anybody's pet that's a pet today being not allowed anymore. So. Um, with that, um, what we want to do is, um, and there's a lot of people in the audience tonight that want to offer comment, um, one at a time, if you want to come up to the microphone, state your name and address for the record if you have something you want to tell the committee. I'd ask that you try to keep your comments to two or three minutes. Um, if you intend to come up and say something someone else has already said, um, just in the interest of expediency, we're going to record all your comments. So. Um, if you want to yield the floor to the next person so we can keep things moving, we'd appreciate that. Um, this meeting will have a hard stop at 6 o'clock, uh, but we'll get as much comment in as we can. Um, so if somebody wants to come up and start us off, we'd be happy to hear from you. Welcome. Can I, oops, can I just, yeah, is that an animal? There's no pets allowed in the city I, hall I except have, for uh, service animals. I have a doctor's animals. note for these, but I also brought them along because they are on your list. Of it's animals service animals dance. only. Service animals, yeah, it's not a sugar glider. It's a dog or a miniature horse are the only animals that are consisted service, considered service well, animals. I'm most certainly not going to put them out in a vehicle. Okay. Um, we, we can't have them here, ma'am. I just want to talk, and then I will leave. 
So why don't we say your piece? Okay. Can we put her up first? Okay. That would be fine. One Let's thing I would that. like to ask is that since there are so many people here and we are recording this, if you have an unusual name, will you please spell it and let us speak your address slowly so we can get everybody in the record. So go ahead. Okay. Come on up. Are, have you changed your stance on sugar gliders? We haven't taken any action on any of them yet. Okay. So if we were to adopt the draft as it was first presented, sugar gliders were to be included on the list. Yeah. I'm Kimberly Tatter. The last name is T as in Tom, A, double D as in David, E, R. Okay. I live in Stoughton, Wisconsin, and I run the Wisconsin Sugar Glider Sanctuary and Rescue. If you put this ordinance in place, it has the potential to swamp me because I've already gotten calls. And I said, just hold on, let's wait. I have successfully gotten the city of Middleton to exempt sugar gliders. Their ordinance reads, no marsupials except sugar gliders. Mm -hmm. Then I went to the city of Madison and I got them to change their ordinance because it did read, no marsupials. They changed their ordinance for me in January of 2013. If I get swamped and can't adopt these animals out, I'm gonna have to kill healthy sugar gliders. And I don't want to have to do that. Okay. But I'm here to to say, you know, some of the stuff that you got from HSUS, they're not in. You're not going to catch anything from a sugar glider that you can't catch from your dog or cat. And sugar gliders cannot transmit or even get rabies. There has never been a case of a sugar glider or any possum or opossum ever getting rabies. Their body temperature is lower than ours and it, the virus does not multiply in their body to be transmittable. So I'm gonna urge you to please exempt sugar gliders. Okay. These are just babies. The adults are not any bigger than my fist. And in the one section here, um, in a letter to the mayor, it said, captive wild animals pose a public safety risk. They list sugar gliders and then it says down here, they can and do injure and kill people. <laughs> the worst bite I have gotten would be like if you've ever gone and donated blood and they stick you to check your iron, mm -hmm. that's what you get from a sugar glider's teeth. They're that tiny. So I'm going to urge you to please exempt them. Okay. We'll take that under advisement. Thank you for coming in. Um, earlier today, I think that we all as well saw an email that had come in um, from the Humane Officer and she received some similar insight about um, sugar gliders and the fact that as far as a category of concern um, that the person that she had gotten her information from didn't consider them to be you know, real, very concerning either in terms of communicable disease, et cetera. So, all right, um, next. My name is Megan Valland. The last name is spelled V as in Victor, I-L-L-A-N-D. Welcome. And I'm speaking for um, a large number of people that are sitting up here on the left in the front, which are members of the UW Stevens Point Herpetology Society, of which I am the president today. Okay, welcome. Uh, the Herpetology Society would just like to stress the um, importance of reptiles and amphibians as um, of course, largely a non chemicable source of disease. The, there is an informational packet which I will hand out, um, which I believe you were emailed today yes. um, by Erica Mead and or Ryan McVeigh as well, mm -hmm. um, who would have liked to attend today to represent the Madison Area Herpetological Society, um, which we also work with very closely, but they were not able to make it today, unfortunately, due to a flight delay and, and the movement of the meeting time. And there is a lot of information in that packet that has to do with the risk of salmonellosis and the transmission of zoonotic diseases from reptiles, um, which stress, stresses the absolute minimal risk um, of disease transmission from all reptiles and amphibians in captivity. Um, and I had some additional comments as well. The Herpetology Society of Stevens Point was founded in 1992, so we have a really strong history in our community on the campus, and we have a membership of over 270 students, including our faculty advisors. 
Our goal is to educate the community about reptiles and amphibians and particularly to encourage respect, dispel myths, and promote conservation efforts for these creatures. So we feel very strongly in opposition to the proposed ordinance, including um, any of the reptiles that were listed, including the crocodilians. And there is more information in the packet about our specific op opposition to the crocodilians as well. Um, the majority of the reptiles which were included in the proposed ordinance as written were harmless constricting snakes and harmless rear fang snakes, which are not considered medically significant to humans. And an outright ban on these creatures with no provisions for permitting retail sale, possession, or propagation would instantly criminalize hundreds to thousands of people including dozens of local businesses, such as pet stores and breeders, who have interwoven these animals into their lives and their livelihoods. These animals are fully domesticated. And that doesn't even include the professional organizations, such as the UW Stevens Point Herpetology Society, which makes use of the animals for conservation and education-related purposes. And um, similar to the sugar gliders, finding s suitable homes for displaced animals after such a legislature has passed, as it has in other cities uh, in the state of Wisconsin, um, is a very difficult challenge, uh, one which places many animals into non-ideal housing situations mm -hmm. or potentially facing euthanasia. Um, reptiles have been established in captivity for generations, and they're a deeply integrated and important part of the pet community in the United States. You might not be particularly aware of it because a lot of your neighbors that have them are quiet about it because of the public fear and misinformation that is so widely spread. But over 4.7 million U.S. households own at least one pet reptile, and they're a part of the family just as much as any cat or dog, and they are less of a chance of spreading disease than those mammalian animals as well. And reptile ownership greatly stimulates the local and national economy in many different areas from pet supplies, veterinary care, local and domestic shipping, gasoline, hotel and venue expeditions, restaurants and tax revenues that um, are income from those animals being a part of the pet community. And many reptiles themselves are actually of significant value to dedicated hobbyists, which is really rare from a lot of other captive, what you would uh, typically consider wildlife, including a lot of things on the proposed ordinance. Um, so they kind of are a unique situation from a lot of the other animals. And because they're such a large financial investment and they're bred in captivity and selectively bred to have specific uh, genes, sort of like goldfish or, or guppies or some, some dogs, because they're so valuable, they typically experience exceedingly good welfare because they're such a, a large financial investment and it's not something that you're going to just jump into lightly and not take care of and, and not protect and make sure that it's not going to escape. And uh, there, there's millions of passionate and responsible reptile keepers. Those are just not the ones that you tend to hear about through the media. Um, the responsible keepers immensely outnumber those few irresponsible citizens who have caused the legally abiding and responsible keepers to suffer for their actions when legislature such as the proposed ordinance is put into place. Sure. Um, the proposed ordinance truly solves no legitimate problem or real threat to public health and safety in light of the reptiles that have been included on the list and only seem to justify a deeply embedded bias toward reptiles, particularly snakes in human communities. And Wausau, like many communities, is home to many reptile owners who deeply cherish and provide excellent care for their animals. Reptile bans do unfortunately exist in some places and most date back several decades. However, many of them have since been repealed or amended as lawmakers have become more and more educated about these animals as organizations like ours and the Madison Area Herb Society have become more outspoken and we feel that passing a law simply because others have done it is not justified reasoning. So we at the UWSP Herpetology Society, and I'm representing the Madison Area Herpetology Society today as well, who could not attend, strongly urge you to do what is right for the community by not supporting reptiles on this agenda item. So okay. may I hand out the sure, information definitely. packets? Yep, if you want to bring it up actually to the clerk and she'll distribute it for you. Okay, we have additional public comment. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I am not here on behalf of any society. I am an exotics breeder. If it sw flies, swims, crawls, slithers, I have probably kept it at some point. Um, 
I guess my little tidbit to add would be for the board to consider um, very carefully some of the origins of these creatures. Um, the previous speaker touched the, on the topic a little bit of um, you know animals being bred for gener in generations and no longer resembling some of their wild ancestors. Um, speaking directly to the incident um, involving the fox, um, I think that uh, a bit more due research could be done um, with that species in particular alongside skunks and raccoons because, um, and I have submitted a form for if anyone wishes to contact me for additional information. Um, but uh, there are captive strains of the of foxes, raccoons, and skunks that physiologically do not resemble their wild cousins. And so I feel very strongly could not be truly considered to be wild because even if for hypothetically they were raised by a wild mother due to generations of being kept in captivity, they would not be able to sustain themselves as a wild individual or even a wild population. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that having kept foxes myself that they are not suitable to be kept within city limits given their somewhat destructive nature and to put it simply every one i've raised i could be i could describe as being like a cat without the superiority complex mm -hmm. so they they are um very touchy they are very mm -hmm. high strung and so while I do not support them being banned outright from the county, um, I do support them not being allowed in the city given their high strung nature and the potential dangers associated with city living. Okay. Any, any decision that this committee would make at any time does not affect Marathon County. Only the city of Wausau proper within the city limits. We can't influence Marathon County. So anyone in an outlying area would not be affected by any decision we make. Okay, thank you. But thank you. For, thank you. For Did that. I miss your name and address? Can you state that again? Oh, my please? apologies. I should have stated that right away. My name is Josh Schreiber. I live at uh, forty six zero six Homestead Road, which is now, since the address changed, two three five six zero eight Homestead Road. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Anyone else wish to offer public feedback? Come on up. Hello. Uh, my name is Garrick Demeyer. And I live at 1709 Eagle Valley Lane in Wausau. I'm actually the owner and operator of a business called Captive Reptile Specialties, and my trade name is Royal Constrictor Designs. Uh, I've been in business for uh, as a full-time profession for over 20 or almost 20 years now, and I mainly specialize in small species of pythons um, I, and geckos. And I've been I've bred a lot of different types of animals or a lot of different types of reptiles. Um, and I'm not here, I'm, I'm here to um, basically explain that, uh, you know, they're, kind of lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, the, uh, I'm not here basically to help support my own business. Uh, whether or not a ban would, would take place in the city of Wausau would not personally affect me, so that's not my motivation for being here. My, my uh, facility that I breed these animals in, which is uh, on uh, East Wassa Avenue, just outside of the city limits. So, I mean, this isn't because I want to make sure that, um, that my business is safe. I don't really sell uh, retail out of my facility. I do mostly uh, mail order. I ship uh, all over the country and actually all over the world. Anyway, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, I think Megan pretty much uh, summed everything up that I wanted to say initially, but I'd also like to offer my expertise and um, and knowledge if you would like to ever contact me regarding a specific incident or type of animal or anything like that. I'm happy to help out and I actually have business cards here that I would like to uh, distribute. Yep, the clerk will come and get that from you. Okay. So, yeah, that's basically it. I mean, the, the, a lot of the species that you have uh, in this proposed ban, um, there's really no, no, there's no sensible reason why they should be uh, banned. Um, and also a lot of people do have them as pets. And uh, you know, a lot of people don't know who, you know, they, a lot of their neighbors may have pets that are um, of these types of animals. And they're just 
there's no reason. I mean, uh, small constricting snakes like corn snakes and ball pythons have no capability of injuring or hurting a person. So I think to lump them into one giant exotic animals thing with rhinoceros and hippos and all that is just kind of uh, not thinking very clearly about the situation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, yeah, any, I'm going to distribute all these business cards. If you do need any help in the future on this, I've got a lot. I mean, my whole life has been spent working with reptiles. Um, I've got a lot of good experiences with them. I was actually a founding member of the UWSP Herpt Herpetology Society back in 92. And I'm happy to, to, I mean, if you ever have any questions about anything and you would like to contact me, you can contact me through the sources on my business card. I'm, I'm happy to help. I want to do what's best for the animals and what's best for the public as well. Excellent. Thanks for coming in. Do we have anyone else that wishes to offer public comment? Mr. Wagner, welcome back. Three, do we have to do the three minutes or less well, rule with you? Careful. <laughs> My name is Romy Wagner. I live at 3500 Gulfview Drive in Wausau. Um, I, I, just my comments is a, from a person in the public and uh, a past member of the council is um, complete banning is the worst thing it's the worst case scenario mm -hmm. for anything. Treating them all as a group or a batch is the second worst thing because you're not taking each species or animal uh, on its own merit. Um, I do know a lot of people uh, that have some of the exotic how you do, some of the exotic animals in their house. Mm -hmm. And really the important thing that comes to mind for me is I better start talking faster, I'll run out of time, <laughs> is that what about the incidents that happen within the homes? I really am curious to, to know if there's ever been any incidents of family members um, having problems with the exotic animal, with, with uh, chameleons or iguanas or or lizards or these small uh, constrictor snakes. Um, what we're worried about, what we're worried about in Wasp is what happens when they get out to the public, the fox got out. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the polar vortex kind of takes care of any kind of exotic animal if it escapes once a year. Uh, and the fact that regulating what goes on in my home inside mm -hmm. something I pay taxes on um, is, is overstepping the boundaries in a sense. Um, you know, we discuss this a lot with cats and dogs and how many you can have. Uh, to have an aquarium uh, with some exotic animals in or to have a, a room in my home that, that has exotic birds and things in. Um, really, if I keep them confined in my home, I keep them controlled in their environment, um, it's an effort by the person that owns them to want them, to understand them, to be educated before someone purchases them. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think that it's, that it's necessary or in any way, shape, or form by, by the, um, the city council to say you cannot have them in the city. Maybe not breeding them in the city or having businesses that sell them without permits, but um, um, have... Um, uh, we wouldn't, I believe we passed something that we wouldn't allow the very large snakes on the public sidewalks or in the parks or something. Uh, that On the 400 block. On the four, and, yep. and that was a step, a compromise in the right direction because the, the snakes that my friends have, they're comfortable with, but a person that has anxiety problems or their small children, those are the ones that we need to protect. And, and the people se seem to need to know that the environment of their home is their castle to be able to do things there, but that we don't want certain animals out in the public um, for other people to have anxiety over. So um, I would encourage you to um, uh, not be over restrictive, uh, to uh, let the family environment, the education uh, that parents that have these animals bring to their kids, to the kids' as friends and things. It's the parents' responsibility, the homeowners. So uh, I would encourage you to, um, again, keep the, keep the brakes on a little bit. Um, I think Garrett is one of the most educated people on the topic around, and there's very few people even know he exists out there, which is pretty cool. So um, 
Uh, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. Hi, my name is Judy Demashik. I'm not from this area, from Monaco, Wisconsin, but I am um, on the board of directors for the Zoological Association of America. And um, I have a problem with um, using an expertise ca um, called HSUS because they are not animal care experts. Um, what they are is lobbyists. And you have, to discern, you, know, you have to discern that from what you're using your um, information from. They're lobbyists and they take people's money and they gave less, one, less than 1% to animal shelters all over the area that need help. So please be careful with that. You have a lot of people in this room that are experts. Um, use that um, and let the people tell you things that you probably would not find out from HSUS. Also, if the ordinance is passed, I'm not sure where this comes from. Is there a real problem? I mean, you talk about the fox incident, which is a domesticated fox, but it's considered wild now. Um, how many problems do they have in the city of, of Wausau that this has to come up and be a problem to have an ordinance? I'd like to see statistics on that. Also, um, if this ordinance does pass, it says it'll be in full force and affect the day of publication. So what happens with all these animals for rehoming them? Um, think about that. What is, what is the city going to do with those animals and placing them in proper areas that need to be placed in proper, proper even permitted areas? Some of these animals might need permitting. Mm -hmm. And that large list that you're giving of the animals, that's somewhat ridiculous because those animals on the large list, an elephant, a rhino, you cannot have those without a USDA license permit. And there are licensing procedures you have to go through, and it would not make it for the city of Wausau. You have to have a certain amount of acreage for those animals. You have to have a certain specification for requirements for penning acreage, mm -hmm. um, uh, exhibit areas, whatever you're going to put them in. So those are kind of ridiculous that they're even on the list because you have to have permitting to have those animals. Mm -hmm. So those should be looked at. And then the other thing is, how are you going to deal with those animals when you have to euthanize all of them? Who's going to come in and take care of that? Is that going to be your control officer that's going to have all the problems on euthanizing those animals in this town? And if you're going to, um, are you going to compensate the animal owners? These are their animals. They take it seriously as a family member. Um, are you, what are you going to do? How are you going to deal with the emotional and psychological well-being of that animal that's been with that family for a long period of time? Now it's going to be displaced somewhere else, and you, you have to think about that. The other thing is um, support animals. Somebody talked about it. I own a business. Support animals are just not dogs, cats, and horses. I've had people come in and say, hey, I have a guinea pig for a support animal. I have a kangaroo for a support animal. They have all the support papers. You have a hard time saying they can't come into your facility. So you have to watch what you're talking about with support animals because support animals, there's a large list of animals that people have. There's peacocks that go on an airplane. You know, a horse goes on an airplane. Um, and if any person in Wausau is USDA licensed, I think your exemptions are pretty good. I read through them. But I think USDA license holders should also be an exemption on there. And any accredited facility with Zoological Association of America should be on there or the American Zoological Association. Those are two uh, associations that people who have large amount of animals that have exhibitory animals, they are accredited with them. They should all be, also should be listed on accreditation. And if you follow the zoological, you did get a letter from Alan Smith. Mm -hmm. He's one of, yes, we will help you out with any expertise that you need in that area of large animals. But I really don't think you have many large animals running around the city of Wausau. We're pretty good about knowing where animals are. Um, the other thing is I have a problem is if I'm coming through, I own land in Portage County, Marathon County, Lincoln County, and Oneida County. And I own large portions of land in those areas. If I bring an antelope from my Marathon County, drive through and have to refuel or save in Portage County and have to refuel in Wausau and stop off in Wausau, legally I'm breaking the law. Because I have an animal that's on your list that's in my trailer in the city of Wausau. So how are you going to address those things? Those are just things to think about when you're going through and doing these ordinances. Most of the time I don't think these ordinances are necessary. 
if you can show to statistics, ordinances should have be, be based on statistics of how many animals you're having problems with and where they're at and what kind of animals they are. And then you can deal with those different types of animals. But I don't think it's a problem. I think you've seen things that were going on in other, other counties and it just is a jump ahead like we're going to get ahead of the ball game. It will influence Marathon County if they decide, hmm, city did it, maybe we should do it too. And it does trickle down to other counties. So yes, it does affect everybody's areas. But thank you for your, my time uh, to talk to you about this. And if you need any information, like everybody else in the audience, uh, call upon us for expertise. Don't go to people who don't know anything about animal care. Okay. Judy, can you state your address, please? 10094 Highway 70 West, Monaco, Wisconsin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else wish to offer public comment on this item? Okay. All right. And so with that... Um, what we'll do is the committee um, that now will um, have some dialogue about the issue. We're not going to make a final decision tonight, but I think what we need to do is um, kind of get our arms around, and this is something that I know we had talked about in December because we as a committee also had some concerns as far as where to start and stop an effort like this. And so, you know, where, where do you start and stop your list, and, you know, what do you do with creatures that are already here? I think we all asked that question in December. Um, you know, we know that at least on the reptile side of things, even with amphibians and arachnids, they're here, people have them as pets, and I think it would be unrealistic of us to expect people to overnight rehome their animals. And, you know, we had talked about everything from, you know, permitting and grandfathering, but then of course it's difficult to figure out which ones have always been here and which ones are new. And, and I think we get down a slippery slope um, if we try to do something like that. And so, you know, I think as a committee, I would like to see us um, take the entire ordinance back to the drawing board and you know we can work through that list um, you know maybe that list needs to be shortened up I think some of these you know large-scale you know animals that you typically find in a zoo where you do need USDA licensing and you need to have some type of ex exhibition credentials for them you know the likelihood that any of those would exist in Wausau is pretty slim so you know I think that um, that we need to do that and I think that um, we also need to figure out, because what we try to do is the least invasive measure first. And, you know, rather than to enact some sweeping ordinance that just draws a line in the sand for, you know, dozens of different pets or uh, different animals that people have, we also, I think, need to um, get a grasp of how large of an issue this is. I mean, we had the fox issue, and that was pretty dramatic, and it was pretty um, raw. Pretty, pretty life-altering for the folks that had the fox. So, I mean, that's... We need to um, figure out where we find a balance between um, what people keep as pets and how to keep the community safe. And, you know, whether or not, the, I think it's even debatable whether or not the community at large was ever really in danger from the fox. And so, you know, that's what, what we have to look at is, you know, what really serves a greater good. And I think that's what the decision that we'll have to make as a committee. Go ahead, Becky. First of all, I want to thank all the people that were pleasant and, and kind and, and emailed me and answered my questions back and forth and the phone calls I got from people from UWSP to, to Madison. Um, and I did have, you know, some conversations. And, and my conversations included, you know, what would you recommend? Is there a um, certain size of constrictor? Is there certain something you would recommend? And, and basically what I got back was that no, they felt the, the only kind of uh, problem or something that you could look at for the animal's well-being, for the reptile's well-being, would be a certain amount of, you know, a cage size or something like that. I don't know if we're, you know, if we're going to get into that, but that's what I wanted to ask. Is there not a, a problem? The second thing is I was skeptical um, back in December, I believe it was, with H HSUS, the, their big thing about Salmonella and Giardia. Um, I don't think that WAS has had a big out. <laughs> you know, cry of that. Um, and I know that that is, you know, dogs have Giardia and Salmonella mm -hmm. just as much. So, so that, that never chickens. bothered me as much. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I do understand. I, I also, you know, to go along with Mr. Wagner's comments is that 
I, I don't want to make an ordinance in looking for a problem. You know, we need, we, I think we need to be the least restrictive. People have a right, you know, maybe I don't, I don't care for rats and people have them and love them and that's just not my thing, but that's okay. And so, you know, as all we're worried about is public health and safety and I don't um, see that as a problem with the reptiles. The only issue that I remember is that one guy with the snake that would go around to the playgrounds and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that issue with this um, person from Madison. And, he's, and the answer I got was, well, that person certainly didn't love their snake. Because people that are true snake lovers and are, you know, the nurturing would never have that snake do that. It wasn't good for the snake to be running around mm -hmm. with those people. So. Um, I, I agree that this will go back, and I am skeptical of anything, even where it says prohibited constrictors more than six feet. I, I'm skeptical of it because I don't, you know, and that's why I ask questions. I'm not understanding what's normal and what's not, but I don't see a problem, and I see a problem with enforcement is mm -hmm. another thing. Mm -hmm. Enforcement on any ordinance needs to be equal, and it needs to be they have an ability and I don't know what how we would only know if there was a problem right. you know with somebody and it would be having taken a snake out mm -hmm. so I I you know like I said I only remember that one guy and that was years ago so I you know personally I'm glad we're going to look at this again and unless I hear something striking that we would need to do any pro prohibition of these uh, due to the size, um, I am leaning towards eliminating that whole species of problems and including the sugar gliders. I mean, mm -hmm. the reason was HSUS said that it was due to, I don't know, so Salmonella or Giardia, I think, mm -hmm. or one of the other. And again, I don't think there's a big out thing of that. that that's the thing I mean the incidence of these animals they exist but they don't exist in mass and I think that's something that we have to look at and I think that when we talked about it in December one of the concerns that um, somebody brought up is that when you try to manage snake size to keep a snake under a certain size what do people resort to underfeeding maybe and you know where does that rest and you don't want to force someone into that position either where they're not taking care of their animal because they're afraid it's going to get you know a foot too long and so you know, I think I think it's something that we have to tread lightly with as well. I think the reptiles that were on the list early on were identified as a bit of a bridge too far. And so I think we need to really take a look at the entire list and see what direction we want to go with it. Um, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, um, I was glad tonight to uh, learn that we're not going to have to decide on this today. I think it's a really... Uh, a tough decision and it's a lot tougher than uh, one might think if you just look at the ordinance and say are you going to vote for this or not because uh, we've heard uh, from people who say nobody needs a reptile as a pet nobody needs that and you think oh okay yeah nobody needs those but then you hear from people who uh, love them and say it's their personal choice uh, to have a reptile or not. Uh, and then you hear about the humane angle. Uh, and I've learned a little bit about the difficulty in uh, properly housing a snake, uh, for example, and the temperature requirements. And um, I'm quite skeptical about the sugar gliders with their fussy diets. Uh, and I am um, concerned about an animal like that or even a snake if it's confined in a small space um, I don't know if that's a good life uh, for an animal like that uh, if you put a four-foot snake in a three-foot box uh, and throw in a mouse once in a while is that a is that a good life for that animal so I think we need to be a little bit concerned about that the sugar glider uh, is a nocturnal animal uh, it is a uh, social animal that wants to be with other sugar gliders. It will bond with people, but it needs to be social. And it um, is designed to glide from tree branch to tree branch, and it's not going to do that in your house. Uh, so have some misgivings there. But then we come back to the personal liberty thing, 
And so I think it's a very difficult decision that we're faced with, and I hope we do well with it. Sure, you can come up quickly, yep. Um, I won't speak on the sugar glider matter <laughs> because I'm not a sugar glider expert, but when it comes to making these decisions about whether or not you feel it is appropriate to allow reptiles to be housed in captivity within the city limits of Wausau, is especially if you have any concerns about the welfare and the ethical treatment of those animals under captive housing provisions treated as a typical pet, like a cat or a dog would be. Um, as previous speakers have said, the UW Stevens Point Herpetology Society and the Madison Area Herpetology Society and Friends of Scales Reptile Rescue um, would all be happy to provide additional information if you had specific questions as well. Um, it is really hard to quantify in a, a simple single statement exactly how to appropriately house these animals in captivity because I can't make a blanket statement for species which range from a you know, gecko as small as your thumbnail to a constricting snake that could reach 18 feet or longer, which surprisingly actually can be reasonably housed in captivity in a person's home if, if done appropriately. So um, we would be happy to provide additional information if you had specific questions at any time. We have a lot of resources at our disposal and we have a large collection of animals on the university property that we work with and we have a, a lot of information available to you if you needed uh, answers to specific questions. Um, and, I, and I urge you to seek out these resources. Um, again, as a previous speaker stated, over the resources provided by the Humane Society of the United States because that is not an organization which um, has concern for the welfare and the, the health and the ethical treatment of animals. They simply want all human animal relationships to be abolished entirely and they have no knowledge or expertise on the specific care and provisions. Um, whereas as people that work with animals can provide that information for you. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Um, where, where, what else do we want to talk about committee? I mean, as far as this goes, our next steps really, I think, are to um, kind of take the list back to the drawing board. And I think one thing we need to do is really analyze, um, you know, like like one of our commenters said, how large of a problem really is this? I mean, in a, you know, in, in the metropolitan area, how big of a problem is this? And, you know, I think that, um, you know, we need to be realistic in our policy making and, you know, determine that, you know, if this is something where, you know, maybe the fox is the first issue in a number of years, is it going to be a number of years before anything else ever happens? And so that's, you know, I think that um, we could probably gain some insight on it, though, from our humane officer. I mean, we have her with us if you'd like some insight there as far as, Ashley, do you want to come up and walk us through a little bit some of the things that, you know, you might have concern with with, with this on one side of it or the other? Um, I can tell you that the fox issue where the CSO was bit was not our first fox issue. Okay. Um, we had two or three foxes that were actually running loose. Um, the day that he was bit, we actually uh, thought it was a different owner because it w we thought it was one of his foxes. So this is definitely an issue. Fox are extremely difficult to contain, um, mm -hmm. like the gentleman had said, you know. They're wily. Yeah, they're, they're very wily. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the foxes definitely would concern me, especially because of the rabies. We, we cannot vaccinate any mammal other than cats, dogs, and ferrets against rabies. Um, that includes cows and horses. They get euthanized and sent in for testing as well. Um, I understand that some of the other animals on the list are really kind of out there. Um, but I have a gentleman who has actually requested to have a giraffe. I've also had people request to have monkeys. Mm -hmm. um, so these are requests that I am getting in. And yeah, they, they technically need the license, but as we all know, you can get anything on the black market. <laughs> I mean, it, it, exactly, you know, you can get a gun anywhere. The point being is if Realistically, this person that asked for the giraffe had already had a goat, got rid of the goat, had a donkey after being told no more farm animals, and then asked if he could have a giraffe. Oh, my. I did not put it past him <laughs> to actually potentially to get go a get giraffe. One. Yeah. Yes. Um, so although some of them may sound very strange to be on there, I don't think it's unreasonable to have them on there because that gives me some leverage. 
Um, as far as reptiles, sugar gliders, things like that, I don't have issues with them. Um, I've had one sugar glider in my five years that has been a stray sugar glider, and there's some funny video somewhere of that. Um, <laughs> but it, one sugar glider ever. Mm -hmm. um, periodically, I get calls about snakes. They usually end up, I either don't find them or I have to deal with them, or they're just wild snakes anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think we've taken in two stray snakes in the five years. Um, and unfortunately, snakes are going to be one of those animals that um, people will probably release um, and think, oh, they can care for themselves. But let me tell you from experience, um, in Weston last year, we had 19 rabbits released that were domestic rabbits. Oh, my. That people think that they can. So limiting it to say, okay, we've had, you know, we've taken in two snakes. Yeah, well, we've taken in 19 rabbits as strays as well. So um, I don't know that that's fair either. Yeah. Ashley, Ashley, I wanted to ask you a question, and I can always ask you this on my own. We've had a lot of discussions, but have you had particular experience with crocodiles and alligators in yes. the city, and what is that experience? Uh, it was not my experience personally. Um, I was told by officers later on um, there is a at least one woman, if not two families, that have an alligator or crocodile. Um, the, we found out about it because she was walking it down the street. <laughs> Do you know how large it was at all? At that point, it was about three feet. Um, in which case, officers told her, you know, you can't be walking it down the street. Um, our ordinance does clearly define cat or dog, I'm assuming because of the snake issue before. Mm -hmm. um, so that was beneficial. I haven't had issues since, um, but they are here. Sure, go ahead. Ashley, as I said, a lot of people have contacted me both from inside and outside of Wausau. Um, going back to the fox, I, I understand that, that there are sellers of domesticated fox in the area. Is that where you're thinking? I mean, where are these people getting fox? Craigslist. Yeah. See, I, I've, been get, I've been getting reports. There is somebody sent me a photo of a... Um, I don't even remember what kind of fox it was. It was a little white one. Um, somebody was trying to sell it on Craigslist, which, I mean, that's about as bad as the black market. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's the thing. And I think anything that we pass, um, it's incumbent upon Ashley to enforce. So I think we have to, you know, tread lightly with that, too, because our goal is to keep the public safe but not make her day any more difficult. So that's, um, thank you for that insight. Uh, committee members, do you have any additional questions for her? I think we're good. Thank you. So at this point, um, we don't have to make a decision on it. Um, what we can do is, um, you're not, we're not going to act on it tonight for sure. If we want to um, do a little more research and maybe redraft, you know, all of it or parts of it um, to get the list right, I would say that we would be, you know, well served to bring that back to a future meeting. <coughs> What are your thoughts on time, Tara, as far as redrafting a month or two? I mean, we're not in a rush to pass it, so. Yeah, I, it, it depends. It kind of depends what we do with it. Like, I know the lady from Inaqua made the point about the USDA license, and I know a lot of people here are, are not in favor of the information provided to us from <coughs> the Humane Society. However, that was a big point that they raised to us about whether or not we should make that exemption and seriously encouraged us not to do that. And so it is going to be difficult. I'm not sure as a drafter where I go with right. an issue like that where you have lobbying people lobbying for that exemption and lobbying people lobbying against it. So mm -hmm. that's going to be kind of a, a stymieing piece for me. It's a lot easier to um, just say, sure, boa constrictors, you know, under 10 feet like Madison does or whatever. It's those kind of issues I'm not sure how to address um, that may take me a little bit just to figure out or maybe I'll make two proposals and mm -hmm. th 
throw them out, but I don't know that how helpful that is. But I can certainly. What is this? This is February. Have right. another. If we want to look at it for a April, a couple of drafts by March. Ashley and um, and Lieutenant Paul's, you know, been a, a good resource for me. And and you know, it's the decision really lies with council in the end. Well, and as a committee, I think for some guidance just for where we want to go after our discussion today. Now, where do we want to send our committee? Do we want to, we need to revisit reptiles entirely, I think. I mean, you know, and, you know, within that reptile chapter, we need to um, determine if we want to even talk about size or, um, you know, not non-venomous animals, which is really what we're talking here as far as pet snakes well and we already this ordinance and I'm not sure whether everyone who spoke tonight understands that this ordinance as it was drafted um, both versions does not prohibit it does not prohibit non venomous snakes and um, you know it's gone back and forth two times on the constrictor thing so I'm not sure when somebody said corn snake I don't even think that's a poison can, snake, can I just make it? a biological yeah, sure. clarification yep. um, there's really only two ways that a snake can subdue and kill its prey in the wild now typically captive snakes are fed, fed pre-killed frozen thawed prey so Neither method is, is strictly necessary for them. But for the way snakes are taxonomically categorized, they are either venomous or um, they are non-venomous, which means they are a constrictor because they have no other method to kill their prey. So your common garter snake, corn snake, um, things like that would be considered a constrictor just like an anaconda or a boa constrictor sure. because they are non-venomous, if, okay. if that distinction makes sense. That helps. Mm -hmm. It does. That helps. Can I ask... I heard a lot. I got a lot of information about rear fang snakes. Now, are those considered the venomous kind sure so that's a really good question in um practice as far especially as it comes to legislating pet ownership a rear fanged snake should be classified with non-venomous constrictor snakes because it poses no significant medical danger to humans the common garter snake is actually a rear fang snake um, the common hognose is actually yeah. a rear fang snake. And while they technically possess fangs and venom, which are words that, that really terrify a lot of people because of our myths and our misconceptions and our, our preconceived notions and biases about reptiles, especially snakes, um, that doesn't actually give it any scientific meaning. And I think the reptile community would be very um, disappointed and confused to see something like garter snakes and hog noses being banned on the um, proposition that they're venomous, venomous and potentially dangerous because their venom poses no significant medical danger to humans whatsoever. And that's what I heard. I mean, a lot of them brought up, you know, you're including the rear fang snakes and I heard, you know, the, the hog nose constantly or whatever it's called. And th that, that is a common snake that is kept. Yes. And so that would really have a lot of people imp you know impact impact a lot of yeah. people so we have that's why you know this whole thing needs to be looked at and and there's so many ins and out and that's why i asked questions of these people that emailed me i said okay just give me some information because there's a lot of information about these that i don't understand and you know it's like you said as soon as they said well if we do venomous then that includes all the rear fanged and those are the most common that are kept, so it it's, needs to be looked at. I think that's a really important distinction to make, and I encourage you to continue asking questions and doing research from your, your local um, and Wisconsin statewide experts on this subject, because yeah. there's a lot of information you can learn. I think that's what we need to do. I mean, we really need to just first get our arms around the problem as far as how much of a problem we really have, and then, you know, we may find through that process that uh, a movement of this size is not practical. Right. You know, or um, we may be able to modify this list to make it realistic enough that it's helpful in managing a specific issue, but not so constrictive that it uh, really upsets um, owners of pets that are very common in our community. And I think that's right away when we talked about this in December, um, one of our 
um, battalion chiefs from the fire department was the first person to say, you'd be amazed how many people have some of these things yeah. as pets. Yeah. You know, we're in a lot of homes and there's an awful lot of, yeah. you know, amphibians and reptiles and things. And he right away thought it was a bridge too far yep. because yep. there's a lot of that stuff already in our community. And that really started us thinking, which is why the public engagement section of this is happening today. So um, does anyone else wish to offer any, any comment or suggestion? If not, um, we won't make a final decision tonight. We'll send this whole thing back. Can I just make one comment? Yep, go ahead. When you have to come up to the microphone. When Pat was talking about the council, um, he was talking about the, you know people's choice of having the animals. You're talking about public safety, so you've got to make sure you're sorting the two things out. He was worried about sugar glider not having an appropriate um, area of a person having as a pet. That has nothing to do with the public safety. Right. So we have to make sure you're looking at that and not people thinking about, well, that can't, they can't have it. We should put on the list because it should not be as a pet. Mm -hmm. So just think of that because that's not public safety. Right. Well, and that's what we have to think about too is, you know, really what is the likelihood that any of these things are going to escape containment and really put anybody in any real danger? And if that's, you know, if they're not, that's, that's one part of the conversation. I think quality of life for the animal is certainly of concern, but I think that in the context of an ordinance that tells people what they can have in their home and what type of pet they can keep, um, we really, I think, need to maintain our focus on what real hazard exists to the community, and if there isn't one, then we probably need to leave it alone. So, Well, in the, the, the condition or care of the animal in the house, I mean, that, or reptile, that's consistent with dogs and cats. With any animal. Too. I mean, yep. we have that humane. issue for everybody, and we do have, that's why we have the humane officer. Humane right. officer. Yep. So I, I would agree, we have that issue with dogs and, mm -hmm. and right. guinea pigs. Yep. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Back to the drawing board. So thank you everyone for coming tonight and offering your feedback. It was really valuable, and uh, we learned a lot, and we're glad that you took time out of your day to come and help us out. So. All right, well, um, <laughs> I'm going to go. I wanted to get that one young lady's name. And okay, so, I all right. Lisa, that, yes, go could ahead. we be clear on when this is coming back? I would say we'll give Tara some time to work on it, so let's plan for our April meeting. Okay. Um, so these folks If in the meeting, yeah, right, at our April meeting. And then at that point in our April meeting, we'll view another draft, and we'll decide then um, based on how that draft has shaken out, if it's still... Um, not palatable and it's still not it workable at that point we'll have to make a decision as a committee as, as to whether or not we want to continue policy making on this issue or leave it be so third so monday in april it'll be the third monday in april and let me just grab a calendar quick so everyone knows 15. it would be there's enough weeks in april that it is april 15th um, at 5 15 in this room Very yes ma'am jermica April 15th is also the deadline for all the liquor licenses in the city. It'll be really hard for me to get you the list of liquor licenses the very same day. Mm -hmm. And I was going to propose us moving that public health and safety meeting possibly the next week so that I can get... To the 22nd? Yes. Okay, why don't we do that? Because that'll give Tara an extra week as well. So we'll go to April 22nd, um, which is a Monday, at 5.15. Mm -hmm. April 22nd. I'm probably not you're gone that day. day? Well, it's the day after Easter, and I was. And you're gone. Chicago okay. Um, let's see. <laughs> Not that you should do anything around me. But <laughs> if you want me here, I don't. <clears throat> Assuming Anna proves nothing. Actually, well, I think what we'll do is let's shoot for the twenty second anyway. Um, because if you have it substantially complete with your notes, right, and you, you always write up a supportive memo anyway, and if we really reach a point where we're, you know, legally in a quandary about what to do, we'll defer action. But we'll shoot for that anyway, the 22nd. That way we can get that done and give everyone a definitive answer. So April 22nd at 515 is when we'll look at whatever draft we come up with. And at that point, we'll have to decide as a committee if we want to move forward or um, abandon the idea. So that's we'll we'll take two months to decide and go from there. Um, with that, we don't have any additional agenda items on our agenda this evening. So a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. Motion by Herbst. Is there a second? Second by Kelbach. Members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. No one wants to spend the whole night here ever. We'll stand adjourned. Thanks, everyone.